Have you ever been in a worship service where you felt God's power and presence, and it was just overwhelming, and you, you got those, I get cold chills, I, I don't know how, how you uh, react to those things, I, I kind of get cold chills, and I just kind of feel the presence of the Lord, and, and I'm sure you've had some of those times here uh, at First Baptist, uh, I hope, uh, where that you felt that power and, and experienced the Lord, but on the other hand, if you've been in some of those services where it just felt flat, uh, and uh, you just didn't feel it, you know, you just didn't feel God. Uh, sometimes uh, a lot of people like to point to the difference between those two sermons, the uh, two uh, worship experiences, as uh, poor singing, uh, poor choice of song, uh, maybe a lackluster presentation of the sermon. Uh, you know, that, that has to be what it is. Uh, because, uh, you know, I just didn't feel it this morning. This church just wasn't right. You know, I just didn't feel good this morning. Uh, now, I, I, would, I would humbly tell you, though, uh, that I feel uh, that uh, the difference in those two sermons, uh, those two, uh, those worship experiences, I should say, uh, is really in the condition of our own heart. It's not in the presentation up here of what happens. Uh, real worship uh, begins uh, in our heart, and it's only when our heart is right with the Lord that we will experience true worship. The rest is just a show. Uh, so, and I know as an evangelical Bible teaching church, uh, First Baptist Kitten, we understand the, the true purpose of the church is to, uh, one, our spiritual growth, uh, but then to also, two, uh, evangelize uh, by leading others to a saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ through the gospel of Jesus. Uh, nothing should stop us from that twofold purpose. Uh, still, our authentic worship, which is the joyful praise uh, of the Almighty God, is the force that drives us to do those two things. Uh, and unless we learn to stand in awe, and wonder of His glory will never have God's passion for our own spiritual growth and maturity or the heart for evangelism to reach others for Him. Uh, the point is, worship must come first. Unfortunately, I believe that one of the problems in the church today is that all too often we worship our work, we work at our play, and we play at our worship. When our worship grows stale, so does our passion for God. The text this morning uh, is in Psalm 95. Uh, we'll try uh, to rediscover our passion for God that comes through true worship. But first of all, first let me give you a definition uh, of what I feel is my definition of worship. Worship is the reasonable, <coughs> heartfelt response of those who have known God's grace through salvation and that value Him above anyone or anything else. Does that sound familiar? Uh, Brother Brian's been trying to encourage us uh, to do that very thing, to love Jesus more. That is worship. Worship is much more than a few songs on Sunday morning. You know, the traditional three hymns and then the invitation. <laughs> In fact, worship is a lifestyle. Uh, worship is constantly putting God first in what we say and what we think and what we do. When we gather together to sing the songs of worship, we're merely putting music to the song that is already in our hearts. Consequently, when we do not value God above everything, there is no song in our heart, and our music is just noise. If you would, if you would, at this time, please stand as we honor the reading of God's Word. <clears throat> I'll be reading in Psalm 95. <coughs> Read all the verses. Psalm 95, David sings a, uh, pins a uh, psalm to God in, he, in his worship to him. And he says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks below him. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as did as you did at Meribah, uh, as you did that day at Massah in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me, though they had seen what I did. For 40 years I was angry with that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts gone astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declare the oath in my anger. 
They shall never enter my rest. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. So in Psalm 95, uh, we see two reasons why we should worship God. First, we should worship God for who he is. We often link the words worship and praise together. You hear that a lot? Praise and worship, worship and praise. However, they are really two different responses to God. Praise is the response to what God does. Worship is a response to who God is. If my dog sits in, uh, where she's supposed to sit, and she comes to me when she's supposed to come, I give her praise. I scratch her ears, and I, I tell her that she's a good dog. I may praise my dog, but I don't worship her. I praise God when He answers my prayers. I praise Him in response to how He works and continues to work in my life. But I worship Him for who He is. I worship Him simply because He is God. If God were ever to answer a prayer while we live on this earth, we should still praise Him for what He has already done for us. Who else is like our God? So as we consider the description of God uh, in Psalm 95, who else could we say these things of? Who else created us and blesses us? Who else or what else could we worship that comes close to God? No one. There is no one. That is why after the first two of the Ten Commandments, God says, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. God is jealous when we worship anyone or anything other than Him. God is jealous when we value anyone or anything before Him. Righteous jealousy is a sign of true love. God's jealousy is part of His love for us. I love Peggy um, more than any other person in the world. I'm so much in love with her uh, that I would become very jealous, as she knows, uh, of anyone who ever tried to steal her affections. Uh, I don't want her to share her love with anyone else but me. It would infuriate me if I saw another man start to hug and kiss her in a way that only I should. Ephesians 5 shows us uh, that Christ's love for his church is how man's love for his wife should be. Since God is preparing us to be the bride of Christ, uh, it is no wonder he is jealous of our affection. How do you think it makes God feel when he sees us chasing after the little g gods of this world? In the Old Testament, God said that his people were committing spiritual adultery when they worshipped false idols. I want you to understand that it breaks God's heart when we worship the God of money or the God of possessions or the God of pleasure more than we worship Him. He doesn't want you to put your family, your work, your ministry uh, in front of Him. God alone is worthy to be worshipped. He is the exclusive object of our highest adoration. Well, not only are we to worship or let the worship uh, motivation for us be who God is, but the second motivation in Psalm 95 for, for worship God is because of who we are in relation to Him. Look at uh, verse 7 one more time. It says, For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. It's important to keep for you to keep in mind, because one of Satan's uh, favorite tricks is to sneak up on you after you've sinned, which you will still do as a Christian, unfortunately, and whisper the lie that you couldn't be a Christian. You can't be a Christian if you do the things that you do. And if you believe that, that that's the truth, you will become disillusioned with your walk with the Lord. You will walk around with your head hanging down, declaring that you're nothing more than a stupid little insignificant person. But when you keep in mind that you are God's sheep, that you can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, telling you that God thinks that you are the greatest person in the whole world. God's opinion of you is not hinged upon your performance as a Christian. It's not by works. He holds you in high regard simply because you're His. You, in and of yourself, are nothing. Our value is only in who owns us. God made us, and He brought us back, bought us back with His precious blood of the Lord Jesus. Therefore, we do belong to Him. He is our shepherd and we are His sheep. Occasionally, we'll hear about 
someone who abuses their pets. You've seen the, the TV shows, uh, the Sally Struthers show, you know, the little video that comes on the commercial uh, about starving animals and makes you angry and you say that person doesn't deserve to even own a pet. Uh, then there are people who go to the other extreme and, uh, you know, they treat their pets like they're people. Uh, they, they're like their, their own little children. They, they dress them up in sweaters and, and uh, walk them around. You know, Halloween's gonna get coming up. You know, it never fails at Halloween. You, Facebook, you see all the pictures of all the little dogs with the little outfits on. The poor dog. Uh, but uh, pitiful, it's pitiful. <laughs> but let me ask you, if you were a pet, which type of owner would you rather have? Uh, would you rather have uh, the one that abuses you or the one that uh, pampers you and uh, takes care of you? But let me tell you about your owner. All right? Your shepherd. All right? He is the Almighty God. He loves you infinitely and cares for your every need. He finds his greatest joy in you. He is constantly thinking about you. His thoughts towards you are more than the number of the grains of sand on all the beaches of the world. And those thoughts, according to Jeremiah 29 11, are to prosper you and to not harm you, give you hope in the future. God loves you so much that there is not a hair on your head that escapes his attention. How can we not worship someone who loves us so much? In order for us to enter into true worship every time we meet, we have, we have got to get it into our minds that worship is for God, it's not for us. We may be blessed and we may be comforted, we may be encouraged as we worship, and I hope that you are as you are here at First Baptist Kenton, but all of that is secondary. When you enter into the doors of the house of worship, you ought to tell yourself that you are here for the sole purpose of worshiping God. When we leave a worship service, we shouldn't be thinking about whether or not we like the selection of song, or if the sermon was any good. Instead, we should ask ourselves if we honored God during the service. We should be wondering if we put our hearts into the worship. Well, not only does this song give us the reasons for worship, but it gives us some ways to worship. And this is, I think, very important for us to remember. First of all, we are to worship corporately. Notice the use of the plural pronoun, us, in verse 1 of this psalm. In fact, uh, this psalm uses the phrase, let us, six times. It says, let us sing, let us shout, let us come before His presence, let us worship, let us kneel. A survey of the first five books of the Bible should convince us that God was very concerned with the way His people worshipped Him. He prescribed all the elements and the order of worship, from the construction of the tabernacle and the temple down to the smallest detail of the clothes the priests were to wear. As the Israelites prepared to possess the promised land, God commanded the people that they were not to offer sacrifices wherever they wanted to, uh, as the other nations did. Instead, God commanded them to worship in a place that He would designate. Eventually, uh, that place was identified as Jerusalem. And three times a year, the entire nation was commanded to come together to worship the Lord. So to the Jews, worship was considered to be a communal event. For a Jew not to go to Jerusalem uh, to worship as a nation would be considered an act of rebellion. That is why the psalmist concludes this psalm uh, on worship with a call of obedience in verses uh, 7 and then in 11. The psalmist recalls how Israel rebelled and disobeyed God in the wilderness. After the Lord delivered them from slavery in Egypt and brought them to the edge of the promised land, they hardened their hearts. Instead of entering into the fullness of all that God had for them, they wanted to get a new leader and to go back to Egypt. And because of this, they weren't allowed to enter into the promised land for 40 more years. Notice in verse 10 that God said that their problem was a heart condition. The same is true when it comes to worship. God wants us to enter into and experience the fullness of His presence through worship. Instead of doing so, we start to grumble and complain about the style of music or the content or length of the sermon. We find ourselves wishing we'd stay home in bed rather than being glad that we came to the house of the Lord. 
And on the way home, all we do is criticize everything that happened at church that day. Brothers and sisters, instead of grumbling and complaining about the music, we ought to be rejoicing that as we ministered unto God through singing, He ministered unto us. Instead of grumbling and complaining about what someone said, we ought to be in awe that we were able to catch a glimpse of God's glory as that person shared what God was doing in their life. Instead of grumbling and complaining about the sermon, we ought to feel blessed that God spoke to us through His chosen spokesman of the pastor. The point that I'm trying to make is that worship is a matter of obedience of the heart. If you refuse to worship the Lord just because you don't like the style of music, it might be because you are in rebellion. If you can't get past the preacher's style of preaching and hear what the Spirit of the Lord is trying to say to His church, it might be because you have hardened your heart to the point that you can no longer hear the Spirit's voice. And if you find it easier to stay home rather than gathering for corporate worship, perhaps you need to go to Dr. Jesus and have your heart checked. I'm not saying that you need to be in church every time the door is open. There's nothing wrong with taking vacations, family outings, or even mission trips. Uh, those, uh, uh, those things keep you from gathering together, but those should be exceptions rather than the norm in your life. Look, I know that worshiping with other believers isn't always convenient, and I know how hard it is to get your family up and dressed so that you can get here on time. I know how nice it would be to sleep in some Sunday mornings, but if you think it's hard to make it to church on Sunday, Imagine the inconvenience gathering for corporate worship was for the Jews. For most of them, the three worship holidays meant weeks away from home as they traveled to and from Jerusalem. Yet, God seemed perfectly content requiring their sacrifice for the purpose of gathering His people in worship. Though we can worship God any time and any place, it's true. Worshiping together gives us a unique opportunity to experience Jesus. The Bible tells us that the Lord is enthroned in the praises of His people. That means Jesus allows His presence to be sensed in a special way when the church gathers for corporate worship. When we gather together for corporate worship, Jesus is actually in our midst singing praises to the Father alongside us. The prophet Zephaniah gives us a beautiful picture of what Jesus does when He dwells among a worshiping church. In Zephaniah 3.14, he says, Shout for joy, daughter of Zion. Rejoice with all your heart. The Lord your God is in your midst, exalting with joy over you, dancing with shouts of joy for you. Do you realize that if God were to open our eyes to the heavenly realm, we would have seen the Lord Jesus singing, raising His hands, and dancing with shouts of joy as we sang to our Heavenly Father this morning. Do you think that seeing Jesus worshiping beside you might have changed how you sang this morning. Or had you actually begun to sing in the first place? If you could see Jesus sitting next to you right now, do you think you might fall asleep during the sermon or doodle on your bulletin? <laughs> I've got a feeling that each and every one of us would have sung like we've never sung before. This is the way every worship service will be for you if you remember that Jesus is in our midst. But not only are we to worship God corporately together, secondly, we're to worship Him verbally. Verse 1, we're told to sing and to shout to the Lord. Now, I may not be the brightest bulb in the pack, all right, but one thing I know for sure is that you can't sing or shout without opening your mouth. Amen. <laughs> Now, I know that many people don't like to sing uh, because they can't sing on key or carry a tune. But let me tell you, I do love to sing. That's one thing I love to do. I've sang in a large choir, a church choir, for many years, and I've loved every minute of being able to lead in worship through music. Well, uh, worship music happens to be a passion of mine, obviously. But, uh, now, as a result, I've known uh, several good singers over the years and learned under some very talented worship leaders. But let me tell you a little bit about my father-in-law, Peggy's dad. He could not carry a tune in a bucket if it was going to save his life. He is so bad. Uh, he got, Peggy's dad's a retired pastor. Um, 
He's uh, had an opportunity to serve with him uh, at another church. Uh, he was pastor and I was youth minister there. And then uh, as he left that church, we founded a, he uh, felt God leading him to found a uh, startup mission church. And he asked me to come alongside him and, and to uh, serve as youth minister and worship leader there. And uh, his singing is so bad that uh, one uh, every Sunday when uh, we would stand here together, and uh, that setup was a little bit different. We had chairs. I don't know if you've seen churches like that where you have chairs on either side of the pulpit. And uh, I would sit in one, and he would sit in the other, and, and we would stand there, and we would lead and sing from the, from the uh, platform here. And uh, it would never fail that I would always have to stand as the furthest point that I could on the other end from him, uh, on the platform because he, he was so bad at singing it would get me off key trying to lead in worship. It was it was it was, it was very bad. <laughs> but you know what I wouldn't ask him to stop singing. I wouldn't ask him to stop singing for anything because his singing came and it still does comes from his heart. A pure heart of worship and joy for the Lord who has saved him. So don't let that hold you back. If that's the only reason why you feel like you can't sing and worship the Lord, uh, it's because you can't sing. Don't let that hold you back. If the person beside you's heart is in the right place as well, they'll understand. All right? <laughs> uh, but this is why I love the fact that God tells us that we are to sing and to shout joyfully, not perfectly. In any church, at least 50% of the people can't sing well. But that doesn't mean that only half the church should sing. After all, God knows whether or not you sing well already because He is the one who gave you your singing ability. God took the credit for our singing ability when He said to Moses, Who has made man's mouth? Have not I the Lord? So it doesn't make any difference how well you sing. God still compels you to open your mouth and let whatever comes out be your joyful song, or noise, of worship to Him. Thirdly, we are told that we are to worship physically. In verse 6, we are told to bow down and kneel before the Lord. Here are some other ways found in the book of Psalms that tells us how we are to physically worship the Lord. Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to the Lord, your God, with the voice of triumph. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. All of these are legitimate postures for worship. The point is that we are to have the freedom to express our worship with our voices and with our body. You can bow, you can kneel, you can stand, you can sit, you can clap, you can lift your hands because these are all biblical forms of worship. You are free to use them in the worship of your God. Please don't ever try to stifle the joy of the Lord by your expression or your posture. <coughs> well, in closing, let me finish by sharing a concern I have for today's worship, style of worship. Some people perceive worship as a way of getting God to show up in a worship service. They believe that if you sing loud enough and long enough or emotionally enough, then God will manifest Himself in a powerful way. While it's true that God moves in response to our worship of Him, yet He only responds if the worship has been a simple response to His grace. If the worship was a gimmick to get Him to perform some kind of spiritual magic trick in our midst, no matter how long or loud or emotional the worship was, He will not move. The danger of perceiving worship as a mechanism that brings about God's presence is that eventually we will start to focus on the act of worship itself rather than on the one we are worshiping, which will result in worshiping worship instead of worshiping God. When we start to worship the worship instead of God, we will be tricked into thinking we've encountered God when all we've really experienced is our own emotion. Let's keep in mind the big picture around us. Let me share with you one of my most favorite chapters of the Bible. Staying mindful of how magnificent God is helps me stay pure in my worship for Him. If you would, turn to Revelation chapter 4. We're 
Revelation 4, I'll read all 11 verses. This, it is very hard for me to read this particular chapter and not just be in awe of God. This is a description of the throne in heaven. I hope you're familiar with this chapter as well. Let me read it for you. It says, After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven, with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, a rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were twenty-four other thrones, and seated on them were twenty-four elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumbles and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne... There was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, under, even under his wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to Him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Maybe this morning you realize that you have stifled your worship or even affected the worship of those around you by your posture or your attitude. I encourage you to take this opportunity to confess it before the Lord. Get your heart back in tune to Him this morning. If you need to approach this altar and pray, don't be afraid that others may see you. Let your obedience be your act of worship this morning. Perhaps you need to establish that relationship with Jesus. Come this morning if He is calling you to accept His salvation and His forgiveness. My hope and prayer is that when you come to the sanctuary, you will not just feel like you came to church, but that you came and worshipped the Lord your God in spirit and in truth, and that you felt His Spirit with you. You can bow to His regret.